What's up guys, this is Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself, where we change lives through volleyball, training, and inspirational content. Welcome to my Volleyball Coach Reaction to Q Season 4, Episode 7. If you're new to this channel, I'm a volleyball coach, volleyball player, and personal trainer who provides volleyball tutorials, jump training workouts, and other cool content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for more content. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas celebration and spent some quality time with their families. James and I are always thinking of ways to improve the production quality of these videos and I was hoping to surprise everyone with a 4K quality high Q reaction video for Christmas. Unfortunately, there were some problems with the recording on my end which caused a long delay in publishing this video. Also, I know the lighting isn't the best in this room so that's another area that I'll be working on with James. I can't wait to fully maximize this studio space and make higher quality videos for you guys. Thanks for clarifying the conversation that Kageyama had with Coach Ukai when he was asking him what it means to be a goody two-shoes and how Coach Ukai pretty much said that your sets are really great and don't be afraid to take more risk and push your players to be better. And I didn't realize that Kageyama was doing this this whole time where he was trying to compensate for his players' weakness. For example, Tsuki wasn't reaching his highest or really maximizing his jump and so he was purposely setting lower to compensate for Tsuki's lack of effort in his hitting approach. So I can't wait to see what Tsuki fully looks like when Kageyama gets him to his highest spiking reach because Tsuki's a smart player and he's pretty tall and he's still not putting in 100% effort into his movements like Hinata. So what does a 100% Tsuki look like? That's gonna look pretty awesome. This is how you can tell that Hinata made those changes completely for himself. The best way to know if you've made some significant change is if other people around you notice the changes before you do because that just goes to show how focused you are on making changes for yourself and not for other people and you don't even care whether other people notice you because you're more focused on making those changes for yourself. I completely forgot that Nishinoya was older than Kageyama because Kageyama acts a little bit more mature for his age and Nishinoya acts a little more immature for his age. So it makes sense why Nishinoya was a little bit offended because culturally, that's not an acceptable thing to do to correct someone who's older than you. Although that's something that we have to keep in mind is that at the end of the day, if someone who has the credibility like Kageyama, not credibility just because he's a good player, but he works hard and he's just as hard on himself. So if someone knows what they're talking about, whether they're younger or older, and they offer some feedback, I think we should all be receptive and we shouldn't let cultural norms get in the way of us trying to be the best versions of ourselves. This is something similar in Chinese culture. And for me, this is something that I definitely wrestled with being a Chinese American because my parents were from Hong Kong and I grew up with some of that old school respect where you don't talk back to your elders. And I did grow up with some of those old school values where you don't correct people who are older than you because that's considered disrespectful. But then growing up in America where it's more of an individualistic culture and it's more of a, a self-made culture where as long as you're successful in your own right, that you should be able to give and receive feedback from anybody. And I definitely see the value in making sure to respect people who are older and wiser, but I also see the value in accepting feedback from anyone. Growing up, it was actually kind of confusing, but now as an adult, I've learned how to balance both and use the best of both worlds. If you grew up in an immigrant household trying to wrestle with two cultures, let me know what your experience was like in the comments below. I also have an exciting announcement to make. I'm super excited to announce that I'll be releasing a 12 month jump training program along with the Elevate Yourself training mobile app where you have access to my high quality training programs that I use for my high school, collegiate and professional clients directly on your mobile device. Get ready to take your athletic performance to the next level coming this January 2022. If you've been enjoying my videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon where you receive early access to special videos like the Q reaction and certain volleyball game videos, monthly live Q&A sessions, my private blog, and more. Now let's get this Q party started. Notice that a lot of the scenes open up with featuring the gymnasium. 
tech up by three points. That was a great animation. So the setter, I think that's Kogane, getting ready to bump set. Let's appreciate how many types of perspective are required to actually rotate those arms. So you have a long arm rotating back towards the center and then up and across his body here. And he's leaning and he's talking. Great animation quality there. There's a nice tip. It's just a rolling under. All right, we gotta talk about that rolling thunder two technique. A lot of people make the mistake of rolling when they dive because it looks cool. And as you can see, Nishinoya thinks it's really cool. But the good thing about Nishinoya is he only does it when he has to. Unfortunately, a lot of people do it unnecessarily because it looks cool. Let's talk about the rolling thunder digging technique. I actually have a tutorial video called Rolling Dive, which you can check out in the description box below, that teaches you how to do the rolling thunder. And it's actually a real move. It's, it's not called rolling thunder unless you're Nishinoya. It's just called a rolling dive. You usually use this when you have to dig a ball slightly to your side. You can't really do this when the ball is in front of you, especially if you're a female, because then you're gonna land on your chest. That's painful for both males and females, but especially females. So if I'm digging a ball that's outside of my platform range, meaning if I cannot reach it with two arms, then I have to extend my one arm a little further. And in order to dive safely and to get up quickly, I wanna extend my arm and roll on the back of my shoulder. And if I form a straight line from my arm to my rib cage, it kind of creates a barrel roll where it allows me to safely roll my shoulder to dissipate energy, but also roll me back on my feet so I can get up and play right away. This technique was actually created by the Japanese national volleyball teams as a way to improve their defensive ability and to get up right away. And it was adapted from their Japanese martial arts. If you study jujitsu and judo, you'll know that rolling is a basic technique to be able to dissipate energy and fall safely. Nishinoya nice. <laughs> now that I understand the cultural element, it's really interesting to see the scene again. I don't think I've ever seen Nishinoya get upset at a teammate. Uh, very black and white. The animation in this episode is really great too. I feel like I'm holding my breath this whole time, waiting for some of the lower quality animations. Aha, black and white. If you're all about getting better, you will receive honest feedback. And I think Kagiyama was saying it in a rude way. I think it was just very matter of fact. <laughs> so he's also offended? Uh oh, Suki's getting involved. That means Kageyama's gonna get more upset because Suki's job is to get under people's skin. Mm -hmm. I gotta bless this new studio with this song here. Get up and rise, Hinata. I almost called you Kageyama. Bless the studio, thank you. The lights came on. Now we can move on. Not to tech up by two points. 
return. Does that mean return of the king? Or the return of the players coming back and applying their skills? Yeah, everyone's pumped up to play Karasuno. I mean, they just won the biggest tournament. What's funny is that at the beginning of the year, nobody cared about playing Karasuno. From losing so many matches to... Nice key! Oh no, Kageyama's getting more frustrated. Yeah, sometimes your body language says more than your your voice. Yeah, Hinata knows Kageyama the best. Uh, I wonder why it's weird that he is not saying anything. Very normal for a introvert though. That's a really hard set to make by the way, to be off on the sideline on the right and then push it all the way across the left. It's a longer distance, which means you have to be that much more accurate and put that much more power into the set. Pagane is inspired. Have you ever noticed that some, a lot of these angles, this is where, I don't know if the director is is motivating some of these shots of how the figures are drawn or whether this is something that the animators are saying, hey, I think this would be a cool angle. But imagine if the average person was going to direct this anime, most of the shots would kind of be head on, right? When you're thinking about filming somebody, you just want to film somebody head on. But so far, only a couple minutes into this episode, I've seen like six or seven different angles of Kageyama. Just kind of like a low 45 degree, low straight on, you know, back of his head. And I think that just makes the storytelling a lot more interesting and makes it more realistic. But something to think about, because I just noticed that every time I see a still image of Kageyama, or like a slow animation, it's a slightly different angle. And that really shows the skill level of these animators in this episode. Like even here, you see how it's kind of a side 30 degree angle looking at Coach Ukai. Ooh, the alumni have come to cheer on. That's one of the coolest experiences is to stay connected with your alumni. And if you're alumni, to connect and try to help improve your former underclassmen. And they even brought the banner. <laughs> Number two must be the, the captain. If you can't pull it off in practice, you can't pull it off in a game. I like these motivational phrases. The impregnable wall of Dateko. Hey, keeping it close though, it's a three point game. I'm remembering correctly, Karasuna beat Dateko at the last tournament. Ooh, a big play. Yeah, middles need to be able to block twice, especially if it's right down the middle. Uh, now Tsuki's turned on his irrit irritating mode. Oh, he called him the king. I think they are the same 
age though, so I think Tsuki would be... He doesn't have a problem listening to upperclassmen, but people his age or younger, he probably would have an issue. Let's go back to Coach, what Coach Ukai said. So Takeda-sensei recommended a timeout, probably because he wanted to be able to hash out the disagreement between Tsuki and Kageyama before it gets worse. I think in general, that's a, a good decision, but I like Coach Ukai's decision even more to let them figure it out and let them fight, especially if it's a practice game. Because at some point, you have to let your players figure it out on their own. Now I'm talking about specifically the social and emotional challenges and the mental challenges. I mean, you definitely want to give them some guidance. And if it gets out of hand where people start yelling at each other, then you need to calm it down and give them some tools to communicate better. But if they're talking and struggling and arguing a little bit, that's actually a very healthy thing for relationships. The main benefit is you get to see what your team looks like under this type of duress. And the second benefit is you're giving them an opportunity to see if they can come up with their own solution to this dissonance. I really like the patience of Coach Ukai here. You don't want to baby your teams. You want to let them be human and let them be siblings because that's how they become closer is when they fight and you resolve it and you make up, you become so much closer. Ooh, forced Asahi to hit out. That's a ten, that tends to happen after you get blocked a couple times. You, you start to make some swings. Oh, and make the damn point. That was intense. That was rude. I miss those halftime animations where they aim at the bottles and do different serves. Not a fan of this heavy bird here. I think I've said that before. Uh oh, is Kageyama gonna explode? He's just been holding his frustration in. Oh, that's some intense animation there. We gotta watch that again. Notice that the edges of his lines are all scratchy and thick and vibrating. That scene alone was gotta be so difficult to, to animate as he's moving, but to make the lines of his body vibrate with different types of thicknesses. Has Kageyama regressed to being the king. That defied. What, that was one probably one of my favorite illustrations there. The, the big canyon to show the divide in the team. Ooh, at least Kageyama apologized right away. <laughs> That's a good way to deal with some of your teammates. Just ignore them if they're acting stupid and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> Tanaka is talking tough. He doesn't really do what he says he's going to do. I like this. Everyone is figuring out a way to communicate with Kageyama and being honest and open with what's going on. Uh -huh. Wise words. Let's read that again. Nothing beats a set that's easy for the spiker to hit. Totally agree with that. That's kind of the, the technical role of a setter. But Coach Ukai takes it one step further. And the only way to find out what makes a perfect set for a particular player is to communicate with them and to figure out what works for them, but then also knowing how to push them. Yes, and, and through that communication, you might have some disagreements, but once you figure it out, 
That's when you know the perfect type of set your hitter needs. I think I'm starting to slowly understand the goody two shoes analogy. I still think it's an odd phrase for that. Asahi is a, a good communicator. Apologizing ahead of time. So polite. <laughs> I think it's awesome that Hinata was the one that kind of started this resolution process of this, this intense communication. Yeah, if everyone communicated what they needed and what they expected of each other, very perceptive. When I first started coaching, I used to view all attitudes as bad attitudes and I would either cut them, remove them from the team, or just be extra hard on them so that their attitude wouldn't get out of control. As I've coached a little bit more and mentored under great coaches like Brett from Archbishop Mitty, John Dunning from Stanford, and had a chance to really just talk to these people and figure out what makes them such great coaches, I've learned that it's important to ask what is the source of their attitude because on the outside a bad attitude might look the same but what drives that bad attitude might be very different now it could easily be that a person is just a brat and is spoiled and gets what they want at home that's fine right those are the players you don't want on the team but sometimes you might get those special players that they have bad attitudes because they're just so intensely competitive that when other people around them are not trying their hardest they lash out at them and i actually think that's a great quality to have some people are born with it actually i think a lot of people are born with it when they're like that that young some people learn that but it's important to decipher between the source of that bad attitude because those are the players that will really lead your team in the future being competitive is something that's incredibly difficult to teach i've had both extremes where i've had very very athletic players that were very technically skilled they jumped high and were powerful but they didn't have this intense desire to win and so when it came to game point situations or the will to motivate your team to come back from being down, they're the ones that wouldn't lead the charge and the team would just perform exactly the same. And I've had the other extremes where I've had less athletic players that were incredibly motivated and they ended up getting way better than everyone expected them to. And they would somehow figure out a way to get the team back on track and even being down two sets, they would come back and win in five. And they're the ones that want game point to finish the game and feel the pressure and win the game for the team. The challenge is teaching these players how to use that fire in a productive way. And that takes a lot of patience because along the way, they're gonna piss a lot of people off and they're gonna frustrate you because they don't have the tools yet. They just have this burning desire that hasn't been tamed yet. But once you can teach them how to use that fire in a productive way, those are the special players. Those are your Kerry Walsh's, your Kobe Bryant's, and so on. <laughs> You're not to never afraid to tell Kagiyama what he thinks. Notice that he's the one, only one who's yelling at Kakiyama. Other than that, he's not just talking nicely to everybody else. Nice cover! Nice cover! That was an interesting nice translation error. In English, or Jinglish, they're saying nice cover, but then the caption says nice save. I'd be really curious to know why did they didn't just translate that literally into nice cover, because that's actually a volleyball term. One and a half, trying to get Suki higher now, huh? Oh, just outside of his reach. 
but this is the time to take risks and push your players as in practice to see what they can do. Oi. Now I understand. He's not going to compensate for Tsuki's low jumping effort anymore. Yeah, that, that memory from junior high, that was a much needed experience for Kageyama. And that's probably why Kageyama snapped back right away because he never wanted to do that to a team again and feel that loneliness. Yeah, and for the first time, Kakiyama might realize that he has to work on things and be better for his team and not just expect hitters to hit his sets. Oh, it's gonna get Suki again. Oh, look at that backswing from Suki. I don't think I've ever seen Suki with those type of mechanics. Oh, and he's reaching at his highest. Wow, hitting over the block. Just how, but that was a good swing. Those are what we call good misses, because you see the potential of those type of hits when they are in. Kakeyama is satisfied. You can fly. The cheerleader. <laughs> the cheerleader trying to stand up for Kageyama and Suki tells him to shut up. <laughs> That's such a strange animation there. Combing his hair down. I thought most people said that the Alsa hitter was the coolest role. You're gonna crown him with a, a towel? <laughs> oh, this is such a, a funny scene. King of the court. And the violin is going crazy in the background. But he gets a smile from Kageyama. It's a rare smirk. A rare calm smirk from Kageyama. Alright, this is like a still image, so I've had a chance to somehow process everyone's body. Let's focus in on Kageyama's head. You notice that the ear on the left and the ear on the right are not symmetrical. Now I know that our bodies are not perfectly symmetrical, but this one I think the asymmetry is a little bit too off. So on the top left of the ear is kind of curved, and then the top right of the right ear is pointed and angled out more. And there's more hair on the left than it is on the right. If you're gonna make the chin and the neck and the shoulders symmetrical, then you gotta make the ears a little bit more symmetrical here. Wow, what a, f what a full circle from Kageyama to expect everyone to hit the ball. Gosh dang it, hit it! Versus, I'm gonna get you guys better. <laughs> Sweet little boy. Yeah, everyone's ganging up on Tsuki now. Get a taste of his own medicine. Yeah, 
very true. You have to understand what your players are thinking and how they're feeling. If they're tired or if they're fresh, if they're emotionally into it. Oh, now Tsuki's crushing it. Uh, he's actually max jumping. But max jumping that much is tiring. That's why Tsuki never got tired, because he didn't really put in his 100% effort all the time. I noticed this whole time Hinata has not played, and they haven't shown the other middle. This is cute. Hinata just saying what he's observed like a little kid. Oh, he's drawing a, a memory from when Kogane was setting him. So when Kogane was purposely setting him higher, Tsugi had no choice but to adapt to the other setter. <laughs> uh, is just in the zone. Even though Suga was referring to, <laughs> to him and not Suki. Hey, I thought Tanaka was working on a sharp angle. <laughs> Kageyama's saying that just to be considerate, not to put him down. <laughs> like that, there's just more open communication with the team. That's right. Use this chance to see what a player plays like under fatigue in practice. <laughs> he sounds like a doctor. <laughs> I will keep his eye. I'll keep an eye on his condition. Mm. This is some great communication. Kageyama is saying to Tanaka that I will decide whether you, I'm gonna set you more because if you look tired, I'm probably not gonna go to you as I manage or keep an eye out for your condition. And Asahi's saying, hey, you can do that to Tanaka, but don't do that to me because then I'd be wondering if you think something's wrong with me. So I'd rather you tell me directly and say, Asahi, you look a little tired or I've been using a little too much. I need to save you for later. So I'm not gonna set you as much right now. This is exactly what you want from a team is to communicate your needs, but also be willing to adapt to each other. His hands out like, you must listen to me. This is the, what's this? Nonchalantly, teammates condition, tell me how others feel, the state of the game. People don't realize how much setters have to keep track of. Not only do they have to know who's hitting well, they have to know how the blockers are blocking. They have to know what the matchups are. Like, do you have a short outside hitter against a big opposite hitter? Do you have a tall middle on your side versus a short middle? Then you have to keep track of whether the libero in the back is going to dig you if you choose to dump. And on top of that, you do have to keep track of how your team is doing emotionally and mentally. And can they handle the type of set that you're going to give them at the right time? Or are you setting them too much or not enough? Being a setter is it's physically challenging, but mentally, I would say honestly, it's more mentally challenging. I would rather have a setter who's not as great at setting technically, but can manage all those things really well in their head than to have a setter who has a perfect sets, but is not tracking anything, whether it's the opposing blockers, your hitters, the mental state. The setting position is definitely more of a mental position. <laughs> True that. Evolutions aren't always positive, but this one was. 
すごい一年生が入ってくれてよかったと言いますが影山君にとっても同じですね<笑> Yeah, Kakiyama's a special talent A little bit abrasive and when he communicates but I really gotta worry about him too much He's just willing to do whatever to, to be the best and to win ごめん。今のは。もう <laughs> Not letting Kageyama get away with anything. I love it. That was a good serve. Oh, Hinata is on the court. Triple blocker! I think that was out. Hey, but they're celebrating like it was in, though. That's a good swing against the triple block, though. That's a great image there. Let's pause it. You see how Hinata's like fully rotated across his body, like he put it, his whole body into the ball. That's how you spike powerfully. It's a great still image. Ah, Date Tech with strong serving and strong blocking. That's a good combination because if you serve tough, they can't pass the ball well. We don't pass well. You set a predictable offense, you have more time to set up your huge block. It's very similar to the Russian style of volleyball. With some early scouting. I always remember that, that drumming intro. Here's my immediate reaction to episode 7. I love that they dedicated an entire episode to the evolution of a team's communication. Again, this wows me to how much depth IQ has. It's not just the technical development of each position, strategizing against other teams, strategizing your own team, but also developing one of the most critical aspects of volleyball, which is one of the greatest team sports, communication. There's no way you can win at a high level without strong communication. And that just goes with how you're communicating with your words, what you communicate with your body language, but also how you listen. A lot of people think communication is just a one-way street. It's about what I say or what I communicate, but communication is a two-way street. It's about how I perceive things and how I am willing to listen to my teammates and be better for them. And I think that's what's really special about Kageyama's evolution. He didn't necessarily learn how to phrase things better. I mean, that did improve this episode, but more importantly, he learned how to listen better and how to meet the needs of his players better. Also, next episode is season four, episode eight. What's special about this episode is, for those who've been following me since the beginning, when I was watching season one, I accidentally reacted to season four, episode eight. And I think it's cause for some reason that episode came up on my Crunchyroll feed as the next episode. And I remember watching that and being so confused because I think there was a practice scrimmage either in episode 7 or 6 from season 1 and the, how that flowed into here. And I was thinking, where the heck did these, all these new players come from? Why are these players so much better now? So it would be interesting to compare and contrast my initial reaction to the first video and my actual reaction after learning all the information from the first four seasons in the upcoming episode 8. So I definitely recommend watching that video, which I'll link in the comment section before watching this one so you can compare. Also, don't forget to watch this video right here and check out all my other Haikyuu reaction videos from all the seasons in this playlist right here.